to our next seventh week uh, talking about Apache and today we want to talk about log files. You know, how do we know uh, that there's activity? And you already had some touch with log files because in our virtual hosts you had two definitions for log files. One was the access log file and one was uh, the, the error log file. But one of the very, very important parts to running a web server, and it has to do with security as well as performance, is we really need to know what's going on. Now, why do you think that is? You know, why is it so important for us to know what's going on on, on a web server? Okay. All right. So it's, it's not just someone breaking in and causing us harm or defacing the web server. Okay. Um, in today's uh, legal world, there's something called e-discovery, okay, which means that if there's a crime that took place uh, involving your computers, your, your IT department, then you have to provide as much information you know, as needed, which could mean a lot of work on your end. Uh, web servers tend to be the systems that are on the outside. They are outwardly facing because people need to have access from home to, the, to a web server, which means that you can't lock them up behind a bunch of firewalls in some, um, uh, you know, natted uh, part of the network that no one has access to. You can do that to databases, and that works really well for databases. No one can see them. They, they're running really well, uh, and then the, the uh, outside security issues are not as, 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 as huge. So with web servers, first of all, there's the operating system security. So you need to harden the operating system. Uh, on a Linux, you probably will use something called SE Linux, uh, and it's uh, designed to take care of the edge systems. But after all this is done, you want to make sure that you can somehow track what's been taking place on the server. So let's take a, uh, take a look at uh, some of the um, some of the uh, settings inside of Apache that help us with uh, knowing what's taking place on the system. I'm going to go into my Apache configuration uh, file and for the moment I will um, I will get rid of my uh, virtual host okay I don't have any of it so that's that's fine um, I want to make sure there's no virtual host configuration and uh, the key directory here is, is logs, and that's under the Apache installation directory slash logs. Right now, my directory is empty. In the configuration file, under logs, there is a whole set of, of settings. First of all, we have the location of the error log. Okay, we can put it anywhere on the server as, as we please, uh, and Apache needs to be able to write to that uh, directory. If you are starting Apache as root, okay, then then even though Apache is running as some other user, okay, it it you 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 will be able to open the log file in um, in whatever location you intend to have the log file, which is why. If you run Apache as root, then you close it. Then you go back to be Napix, and you try to start Apache as Napix. It'll say it cannot open log files because root was just writing through those logs. It put its user and its group on it, and Napix cannot uh, write to them. <laughs> okay, so notice that we we get to specify the location of the error log file, but we don't really get to specify um, what columns. Okay, what elements will be visible in the error log file? That's because error log file is considered to be uh, a sort of the dumping space for, uh, for all kinds of information. And instead of saying, give me, give me just one or two columns, what we get to decide it is the detail of how many lines will be put in the error log file. And that's done through the log level directive. So 
the least amount of entries will be at the emergency level. At the emergency level, you will know when Apache has crashed. Okay? But other than that, uh, when a, a user goes to the wrong web page and you have to issue 404 error, file not found, that's not going to be in the error log file if you have it at the critical level. So warning, warning is okay. There's going to be quite a few entries there. Um, error level is probably best for production settings, okay, to have it at the, at the error level. Maybe you are trying new modules or you're trying new settings in your Apache system. You might want to increase the level of logging from warning to notice, info, or debug, right? Because you want to know more as to what's happening. It's my server is crashing. Well, why is it happening? Increase the, the level of logging, and you'll be able to, uh, to figure that out. OK, so that's error log. Let's see how that works. Uh, we'll go ahead and, uh, and save this. Um, I'm going to keep this part open, and, and, and I'll start Apache on a new line here. OK, start server. And uh, that's happening because I'm listening on port 80, probably. So I'll go ahead and switch that. OK. And so let's try to run it again. Uh, OK. OK, so now we're running here on port 8080. Let's uh, start a browser. And uh, close this. We'll go ahead and uh, refresh. Uh, we'll go to localhost 8080. All right. And maybe we'll put in a web page here that doesn't exist. So if I was to preview my log file, which currently is in Apache logs. Okay. What I see in the error log file is that, OK, Apache started. There are two files that the browser requested uh, which did not exist. So 404 messages were, were uh, distributed. That file is this little icon right here. Okay. So if you would like to customize on your own website, what this icon shows, then you have to have uh, a file called uh, fev icon in your in your uh, document root. Okay, so let's see if we can do that um, just for for the needs of presentation here. So google.com slash fev icon dot no 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 oh, what's the name of it? Um, yeah, that icon. Okay, fev icon. ICO. Uh, and of course, that happens because I, I changed my DNS some time ago. Microsoft? Did I mess with that too? OK, so there's Microsoft icon. And so I can just say now, save this as, and put it under Nopix, Apache, HTDocs, and then save. OK, now when we go to well, any of these websites, but let's go to localhost, back, refresh. We will in a minute. Now, let me restart. Ice Weasel is a little bit of a. Okay. Uh -huh. Localhost 8080. There it is, right? And there's the Microsoft icon. So, so it automatically asks for it. So, the first thing that we learned about the error log file is that it helps as a system administrators to fix things, but it also helps to improve the quality of the website. Because if there are images that are missing from your web pages, you may never know until someone you know, picks up the phone and says, oh, listen, there's this little icon in my browser, <laughs> and I'm missing it. <laughs> right? They're not going to do that. Uh, but as you are looking through your error log, you might notice that, hey, um, this is not what, what, what should be here. Finally, look, I also have the error for this URL. Right? So it's, by the way, it's not showing you the URL. I, I misspoke. It's showing you the physical 
address that it's trying to locate, right? So sometimes you might have files that you expect to work, but because they don't exist in the correct directory, they're not showing to their users. So there are techniques inside of the config file uh, by the use of aliases, just like the icons that, that, that we played with. You say slash icon slash, and that takes you to some other directory that's somewhere else in the file system. So you could do it, uh, you could do it here as well. All right, so, <clears throat> so that's how we can fix uh, some of these things. Now let's go ahead and change the, the level of, uh, of, um, of our error log. And we're going to go, go to debug. All right, debug mode. And for this to activate, we have to restart. Okay, and now we're going to go ahead and, and refresh a few things. And now let's preview the, um, uh, let's see, let's do this. Let's preview the log file. Okay, so we still have the same previous error messages for a 404, but then there's a debug level error saying, hey, we are, uh, we're going to uh, uh, fork a new process. Or, hey, this is information level. Uh, the server was built at midnight on January 24th. Now, oh, that looks good for me. You know, I stayed here with you at midnight. Uh, no, in fact, what's happening is our time is all messed up because when I put the virtual machine in sleep mode, it thinks that the next second uh, of time is when I resume, so the time is often messed up on it. Uh, but you can see sort of the benefit of having additional information, especially if you are trying to find uh, problems on the system. So here in the, uh, in the parentheses, uh, or in the square brackets, you see the level. So if you see a lot of messages in your error log and you'd like to limit it, you just have to look at the square brackets to see what, to what error to switch so as not to see the upper level messages. All right, so that's, uh, that's the error level. And uh, uh, it, it's, nice to, it's very nice to, to track errors to, to be aware of what's, what's happening on your system. Now, if you have um, a need to monitor your error log carefully to say, when a user attempts this URL for whatever reason, okay, you don't want that to be happening and someone attempted a URL, you can have the cron job, so a scheduler in Linux or task scheduler in Windows. You can go through your log file every 10 minutes or every five minutes or every minute and look for that specific URL entry. And when it happens, then send yourself an email, right? So that way you don't have to be sitting there watching the, the uh, error log file. But whenever something happens in the error log that you want to know about, maybe your server is restarting for some reason too often, or, or something just is happening, you go ahead and, and uh, send yourself an email. And uh, the, so these techniques of monitoring log files are directly related to your ability as the operating system administrator. So right now, let's say if I was to uh, look for um, entries that have uh, the, the pre pre-fork in it, so for some reason I notice that whenever this error message or debug message is in my log file, something doesn't work on the server, and I want to know it right away. See, I could, I could put this particular um, this particular um, entry in the cron scheduler and then say, say mail as trouble on the server and then provide my email address and this particular command whenever there are some entries of this sort in the error log will actually send an email. You want to be careful when you do that <laughs> because when you're not doing that uh, efficiently right now you see whenever at least one line exists, every minute an email will be generated. So what I've done in the past in the system is I, I, I include a small bash script that basically says, first of all, tell me how many entries there are of this error in the log file. Store this number by itself in some kind of a file locally. And whenever you're running this bash, you're going to first read in the number of errors that you detected before. 
you're going to say, is the new number of errors different than the previous number of errors? If yes, then send me an email. But if you already emailed me once about those five error messages, then, then, then just skip that. All right, so again, um, this monitoring is going to uh, require some, uh, some other knowledge of, of, of the operating system to do this. So let's take a, another look at um, additional logging. And at this point, all right, at this point, we are talking about log files that give us information about successful activity. So not just error log. Most servers have a log file where errors are logged. That, that's needed. But, but very few servers actually have a detailed log of everything that's taking place on it, right? But web servers being those outwardly facing, it's very important that, that we do that. Uh, Apache server can be used as a proxy to uh, take internet access and then distribute to other systems. So in a middle school, there are legal requirements to monitor and, and prevent access to certain websites. Legal requirements, right? It's not just nice to have. So you would have Apache restrict certain URLs, and then you want to make sure that you store, every time someone goes to a website, that you store that as an entry. And that's what these log files will do. So, so first, we again can determine the level of logging. And um, on some servers that get very busy, this is a concern because logs, I've seen logs grow in gigabytes. All right? You have a gigabyte text file, and you start wondering, when are you going to read it all? Right? <laughs> so you never read the whole thing, but basically you end up grabbing through it, and it takes a while to actually go through it. Uh, so you have a, a, a log level debug uh, for a development system and for the first few months of, of a life of a service just fine. But then, unlike in the error log, with these log files we can create our own um, schema for the log file. So, log format is a directive that creates a specific log format type. Okay, So, we are creating uh, a log format called combined, okay? So log format, and then in the middle is the definition, and the, at the end we'll give the name for it. Log format combined, common, refer or agent. And then, as we define log files, we're going to say, I would like to put the combined log file in this, in this location. I would like to have the common log file in this location. And that's done with a custom log expression. So the directive custom log says custom log, location of it, and then what type of a log you'd like to see here. Now, you might think that, hey, let's just put all the possible options and just have the biggest log that, that we can have. And that makes good sense. You probably should have a log file like that. Um, but there, there are programs that aid you in um, analyzing log files. There's one called Webalyzer, there's AW Stats, and others. Um, in addition, in today's security setups, you might have a, a prevention system in place for, um, oh, what are they called? Uh, I have, uh, hmm. IPS. IPS, yeah. Um, so what does it stand for? Intrusion prevention system, that's right. Intrusion pr prevention systems or uh, intrusion detection systems, either, either one. Basically, they're like little um, wire traps set up on the network to uh, detect uh, uh, an anomaly problems <laughs> or to detect activity that's incorrect or, or that's, that's malicious, all right? So, when that happens, these systems might, might expect that you have the common log type, right? Just like Webalyzer or AW Stats, you are feeding a log file for analysis. Well, that log file has to be of certain type, of certain columns. And so that's why it's not totally flexible, you know, which um, log file type you're going to be using. So uh, if, if we quickly look at... Um, Let's see. Uh, let's look for um, Webalyzer. 
All right. So here's Webalizer, and um, let's see. Uh, download sample report. There we go. So here's a sample report of Webalizer. Basically, all all you do is you in, on the Linux prompt you say Webalizer, and this comes out as a web page. It goes uh, and then daily updates your your um, your report. You can go to a specific um, to a spe specific month to see the statistics, and all of that is pulled simply from the log file, right? And you end up having some graphics. Uh, you go to to meet with uh, you know management. It's nice to bring some graphics with you. Uh, it makes you look good, uh, and um, especially you know you say we made a change right here. And so you see the amount of people that came to see the new website, and so that really helps people to see. You use words like synergy, right? And it all comes together. Okay, uh, and then because it's all in the log file, it can show you which which of your uh, URLs are most uh, um, you know visited. Uh, and and so uh, if you have referrers set up, uh, then you can also um, have the the um, places where they came from. Here is uh, here are resolved a host of the people who came in, and and, and he, uh, again this is the report that would show you where the people came from. So most websites, as you click on the link, they'll carry information where they came from, and that can be also included in the log file. And then the other one is uh, AW stats, and. Uh, see uh, I'm sure there's somewhere here there's going to be a picture static demo okay so um, what I like about AW stats is that you have this whole menu on the left so all of this is automatically generated right but you have a menu and AW stats is very useful for a database driven website because it can look at the parameters too so it's not just index.php that got hit a million of times, but index.php question mark page ID equals is going to be tracked differently than you know page ID equals one versus page ID equals ten. So uh, so so AW stats will support that. Um, so basically, you know, a set of useful data. Yes. So I was curious why you would use one of these over Google Analytics. Hmm. Thank you for the question. So, two different data sources. Google Analytics is created by you inserting JavaScript into HTML so that when someone visits your page, they also download code from Google. Therefore, Google can track what was viewed. Yeah. Okay. So, and then Google has all kinds of intelligence based on that. So for web pages that do not have this JavaScript included in them, okay, Google Analytics would not be tracking it. Right. This is where your local logs would come in. Okay. Or maybe you have web pages which require um, that they are behind a firewall, that are just used by internal folks. Okay, and, and, and maybe you, you, you or or maybe it's a website where you don't have the option of adding your own code for Google Analytics. Now, having said that, Google Analytics is, is just fine. Okay, it it is the overhead because uh, for every time that your page downloads, they al also have to download code from Google. Right. Also, uh, as as you have your own JavaScript execute and you are inserting other JavaScript, there is a possibility of you know issues as the browser renders. Um, so having said that, there are two different logging capacities, and your own log files are going to be more accurate because if your log files don't show that something happened, then your server just didn't do it. Okay. Versus, uh, for a while there was a problem with Google Analytics where um, I think it was Internet Explorer six, it didn't it couldn't load the JavaScript. All right, so you had the browser that basically couldn't execute, and so all those visits went unnoticed by Google Analytics. Uh, having said that, though, a lot of developers love Google Anal Analytics, and I've I've seen them, uh, and and I use them on um, some of my websites. Um, 
but it's a different data source, different data source, yeah. Yeah. Um, this brings me to um, a related uh, issue of uh, tracking uh, of tracking where users came from. Now you could see that um, both with all AW stats or or with uh, Webalizer, there is an option here of saying show me the origin like like right here somewhere where it'll, it'll show you the the countries where you came from uh, it shows you of course the types of machines um, browsers uh, right here right and so this information is mined from your own log file uh, what I'm doing here as a, as, as a project uh, for Blackboard is by including this image which is coming from another website, I can now click on this image and I can see who, uh, where are the people that are actually, um, those are advertisements for, some, for something else, not the actual faces of students. <laughs> uh, but it shows you where the people came from. And it'll put it on a, on a map. Uh, it'll put it on the map right here. Uh, or uh, this one right here will actually draw it up onto a... Uh, a, a Java applet, but this is the kind of the style of this is the style of um, tracking as as Google Analytics does, which means that you include some of the code on your site, and then they can do some magic with that because it appears in their log files, see, and, and or they or they do some special logging for that. So. Um, so yeah, this is pretty cool. You know, you can you can move this thing around. You can uh, you can uh, zoom in, or or well, it works most of the time. Uh, <laughs> beta, to, to 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 say the least. You're mapping where this uh, mm -hmm. access is coming from. Are you mapping who's coming from there? So those pictures that you saw, those maps, those are actually external websites. So, so whatever they are noticing, which they most likely are noticing just the IP address, uh, but but this is now uh, access a log file here can, uh, depending on how you are logging in. Okay, um, if you are logging through basic authentication, then the log file will have the user ID for every user. If yeah, if you uh, uh, the agent is actually the browser. So the log file calls the agent, it uses the expression agent, but it means the browser itself. But you can, let's say in Blackboard, when you, when you log in, you type in John Smith, put a password in, and as long as the URL that you go to will display your username, then that will go in the log file. And then you can track who logged in as well, okay? So a lot of applications will say in the URL, user equals and some username because that way they can track in the log file too of who who's been logging in okay yeah but if you don't have the password sign in then wh then whatever appears in the URL is going to be in the log file I wrote this module uh, for for an enterprise system that allowed you to change identities so I log in as administrator but you know these users, they always call and say, it doesn't work for me. Okay, it works for everybody, it's not for me. So then, uh, this module allowed you to say, I want to log in as that other user. And then I could log in as them and see exactly what they see. Well, uh, as, as the login of, 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 to keep track of history, basically, this module would, would uh, allow you to hit submit. And then in the URL, it would say old user equals and new user equals. So now in the log file, you see there was an entry of who logged in and how they changed their identity. And because it's in the log file, then it gets on the backup tapes and, you know, years from now, you can still figure out who, who did something. <clears throat> but as a, you see, that, that helps us to understand that as a web uh, developer, as you, create, as you create an application, what you put in the URL is always going to remain as a historical record somewhere. So you want to avoid putting passwords in the URL or important numbers or, or things that you don't want to have stored. 
Okay. Um, so these log formats, uh, the combined log format is it's probably the best option because it'll include the browser information, the refer. Uh, by default, we only use the common log format, okay? And so that does not have um, most of the information that, that we would like to see. So I'm going to change, and uh, uh, for this matter, I'll create a new log file called access log underscore combined. And uh, I have to specify here that it's combined. Right? And so you can have as many log files as you want based on the different formats that you specify. Okay. Now, last week you've noticed that per virtual host you can have log file so that that specific user uh, for that specific website they have their own log file. Because obviously their index.html is something different than on some other website. So let's go ahead and, and, and save this. Uh, <coughs> we'll go and, uh, and restart uh, Apache once here. Whoops. Uh, all right, restart Apache. And now we'll, we'll reset this a few times. Uh, okay, let's get a nice set here. All right, maybe icons. And now let's go to, let's go to the log file again. Notice that I now have the combined log file and the regular access log file. And if I preview my combined log file, I now have quite a few additional entries. Notice that I can see this is a, a GET request versus a POST request. There is an icon that was requested. It was delivered in a specific um, Okay, the first part is, is, is the HTTP code. So 200 means successful delivery. And then this is the size of it in bytes. And then uh, we have uh, the uh, URL that was typed in to, to get it. And this is my agent. All right, agent is a signature of your, um, of your browser. So if I was to go to a website, which I happen to know uses this uh, expression, um, okay, it's displaying to me right here the agent of my, of my uh, browser. So depending whether this is IE or if it's Firefox, the agent will be different. And if you upgrade IE or Firefox, it, they'll adjust too. Now, in addition to that, you can get with Firefox, uh, tools add-ons. Uh, let's see, tools add-ons uh, plugins. Uh, okay, I'm get add-ons. There we go. And there's a search box agent, user agent switcher. Okay. And so the reason why this is so cool is because, uh, and I hope that'll work. The reason why this is uh, uh, great because some websites will actually display different information depending on what agent you're using. Just like Apache can capture this information, a PHP script or even JavaScript can capture whether you are accessing this with a phone, with IE, or with Firefox. And then they display different stuff. So I love these websites that will say, uh, you have to use Internet Explorer to log into this website. <laughs> and then you get a module like this, you j Agent Switcher, and you can make your Firefox behave or, or look like, a, like a Internet Explorer. But if you are the phone, you see, then, then suddenly you go to something like uh, WordPress.com, right? And, and you see it to be quite different because this actually fits on, on the phone well. Uh, or maybe you go to something like uh, wikipedia.com and, uh, and this thing is going to, uh, well, let's say, uh, Hemming code. All right, and, and look, as the phone, you see the interface changes completely. Right, that's the idea. And so then uh, uh, if we switch to Internet Explorer 6, um, 
you know, they, they end up, whoops, must be cached. Or maybe that's how it's supposed to look for Internet Explorer 6. <laughs> well, anyway, um, or m maybe I'm supposed to do it here. So, uh, so you can appear as, 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 as different, uh, different types. And so hopefully as you go to uh, maybe this website. All right, so you can see that we are uh, appearing to be Internet Explorer 6. Firefox has the setting under about config. You might void your warranty. I'll be careful, I promise. OK, well, then. <laughs> <clears throat> Gotta love that. Um, so I don't know if you ever used this capacity of Firefox, but it allows you to modify all kinds of little settings that they don't have interface for yet, which is what the little agent uh, module does. But basically, right here, you can retype whatever you want. So if you want your user agent to say, hello world, which might cause some issues with websites that actually care about it, right? If you go back to... Um, Right, and it says hello world. Um, so anyway, that's uh, that's the user agent, and as you are looking at your server at at the user agent entry, uh, you got to understand that it is editable, right? So it's not something set in stone. Just because it says Windows, it doesn't mean often that that it's Windows system that's using it. Um, the one thing that is reliable is the IP address that the request is coming from. For me, this is right now IP6 address that's local host. So that's why it looks sort of uninviting. But this is one sure piece of data because in order to connect to your system, someone had to use the network. And that IP address is going to be accurate to whatever the previous node is. So if this was a library with a proxy, then everybody in the library accessing your system will appear from the same IP address. Um, all right. All right, so log files, and we've mentioned the different systems that you can use for analyzing log files and, um, and, 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 and how to do that. Good. Um, let me uh, show you a couple of commands that are useful with log files. Tail will show you the last few entries in the log file. All right. And notice the difference between the common format of a log file and the combine, right? I mean, a to totally different uh, set of uh, options there. Uh, tail, OK, on a, on a um, Linux system, you can say cat, C-A-T, which is going to show you the log file from the bottom up, which is very useful. Then you can use tail, all right? You can say tail-f. And now the log file is being uh, shown to you as it is being created. So if I was to resize it just right and hit refresh, you can see it growing. And notice that the entries here for my icons page don't refer just to the URL, but every asset on this page, like a picture or, or a JavaScript, if there was any, it's going to download separately. And, and the entry in the log file is for a separate request. All right. <clears throat> so that's, that's another file here, tail-f. And uh, once the log files get to be very, very large, and they can be into megabytes very easily, gigabytes very often, you have to rotate them. Okay? And the rotation of log files is, is not a trivial matter. Um, but most Linux systems have a, a program called log rotate. Well, apparently not the uh, not the um, Napix system. I guess they they don't uh, on Napix they're not worried about you having large log files. It's it's intended for a workstation use. But the log rotate is part of the operating system, and. Uh, you can define a little script for that program to say, my log files are in this directory. Okay, my uh, restart program 
or, or uh, my, my PID process ID is stored in this location. And so uh, let me show you uh, which location I'm talking about. So in logs here, the location that log rotate would take is this right here. That's where our log files are. And this httpd.pid is a very important file which stores a single number. And this number stands for the running process, the running process of the parent of our Apache service. This is why it's important to the log rotate, because to, to rotate a log successfully, you have to, number one, rename the existing log. For the split second, if someone asks for a website, it'll not be logged. Okay? So you first you rename the current log file. Then you issue um, a restart request to the, to the process ID, which is contained in this file. Once you say Apache parent process, would you please restart yourself? It'll reinitialize log files and start a new log file. Then the log rotate system, if it is configured to do so, it can compress your text log file and give it a name that's sequential. So it'll say something like access underscore log dot one dot gz. Um, all right, does that make sense why you would have to restart Apache after rotating logs? All right, so that's, uh, in, in, in Unix, you can remove a file from underneath a user who's writing to it. That's not a problem. But you cannot remove a file and then expect that the program can still write or, or to, to the same file. Um, now, depending on the software, that, that might be possible. Oracle, for example, you can remove the alert log and it'll continue rewriting new one without you having to worry about it. But most uh, programs you have to restart, so log, rate, log rotate handles that. A log rotate typically is scheduled for four in the morning. Four in the morning, everybody's expected to sleep. Okay? People in other time zones disagree, but, um, uh, but most servers are going to rotate log files at four in the morning and uh, like I said, there is a split second, very small split second, that uh, when you rename a file and while it's restarting, that nothing would be logged properly. You could, but, but the idea is to, um, to do it as quickly as possible, I think. So, so that's why it's actually a kill signal that's issued to, to it. So it's really a, a restart command that, it's, that, that goes through. But it's up to you. It was inside of the log rotate configuration file, you can specify what should happen. So if you would like to investigate a new way of starting it up, you, you can do graceful, yeah. Um, needless to say, it, it works, you know, the setup works fairly well long term. And, and, and you want to keep your log file small because after a while, um, especially on 32-bit systems, 64-bit not so much, but 32-bit systems, they had a problem where if your log file was two gigabytes in size, the web server no longer could write into it um, what the underlying magic was. I'm not sure. Maybe it had to do with the file system type as long as it being 32-bit. Um, but basically, Apache struggled with, 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 with putting the, the, the data there, which meant that it also then started to act uh, uh, without um, uh, the expected results. So keeping log files down, so you can rotate log files more often, right? I mean, if you need to, you could do it twice a day. Or you can change the log level from debug to warning or error. Good deal. Any questions about this so far? All right, so what I want you to do is I want you to do a little bit hands-on with uh, log rotation. Uh, let, me, um, let me navigate to our, to our system. And um, under assignments, You'll find um, a log, uh, log lab. Okay, and this is how messing with your agent types 
breaks websites. See this visual editor no, no longer loads, <laughs> and it's because of uh, of it being Internet Explorer 6 or my XMI Hello that world. So default user agent and uh, and cancel and reload. There we go. Works much better. So now uh, I'll go ahead and enable that. And let me explain what's going to happen in, in, in inside of this lab. All right, first of all, you, you can go ahead and investigate the log files like what I did in terms of changing their names and ch changing the format. But in this example, you're going to use um, a program called AB. And this program compiles automatically when you compile Apache. It stands for Apache Benchmark. So instead of sitting there with a refresh button on IceWeasel, you're going to issue a command that says Apache Benchmark, run it uh, uh, dash n, so that's how many times to run it, and dash c, how many concurrent users should execute it. So you, you'll hit refresh 200 times on the local host URL. Then in the next line, you will run it 200,000 times as 1,000 users. Hopefully what you'll see is that your log file grows fairly large. All right, and so you can watch the log file with a tail dash F to see um, the, the log growth. Then you're going to use a module called server status. Now this is the first module that we are going to uh, investigate uh, in our config file. This module, server status, uh, let's see. All right. We go here, server status. Okay, it, it has to be activated. Status. And so it's activated uh, by commenting in the extended status on. Uh, right, and so it explains that when this is turned on, then, then there's a URL that gets activated called server status. So let's save that and uh, we'll restart Apache one more time. Uh, let's see, it's here. Okay, bin Apache restart. And so now if I go to server status, Server status. Well, that sure isn't working for me. Um, let's see. Well, let's look at the instructions. Oh, I see. So this is all good um, lab information that not only do we do extended status on, but we also have to uh, enable this location directive. And this location directive, you might notice that it denies access to this URL for all with the exception of example.com. So one way to take care of this is basically to comment out the last two lines. And we'll talk about the deny and allow in a future session where we talk about access to the server. But hopefully now um, I will at least be able to show you the, the result. And then as, as you walk through the lab, I can help you individually with it. But basically, this particular module uh, gives us information about usage of the system without having to look in the log files. And as you, at the same time, run the AB Apache benchmark in the lab, you will see all these little dots filling in because these dots, they represent the, the uh, Apache processes. So the first one is writing and uh, we specify to only have five available for, for listening in addition to the one that's working. 
So the more requests we make, you will see more and more being started up and there's going to be all kinds of activity taking place. And the status from an underscore goes to starting up, reading a request, sending reply, and uh, uh, it, it includes the DNS uh, setup, closing, and then the idle, um, uh, idle process. Uh, and, and W being sending reply. And it makes sense that while I'm viewing this page, that the status of my, of my process is writing because it's actually sending me the information. And we have information on the server itself uh, and, and the process. And it's just a handy little, uh, handy little module that gives you a quick look into what your server is doing currently. OK, so that is the idea of, of running the lab. And then uh, one of the final entries here is going to be a little bash script with a for loop. And I'm really proud of that line because it's, it's a really cute bash script that's going to run and then wait every two seconds. Okay, But this particular script is going to create an error. It takes a little bit thinking of how to create a bash script that creates an error every time, but a different error. You don't want to see just the same URL. So this one is going to produce the date, OK? And it's going to uh, show you seconds. So that way, every two seconds, it has a different entry. I'll, I'll show you how this might work. I'll just, I'll just um, oh, let's see. Let's, uh, let's log in here to Apache Benchmark. So inside of the bin directory, there's Apache Benchmark. And uh, we'll say, uh, run Apache Benchmark uh, as 200 times as a single user and run against Apache local host 8080 and make sure to execute. Uh, by the way, in front of the uh, command date, it's a tick. It's not a single quote. Okay, A tick is on your keyboard above the tab key. Uh, without the shift. The shift is the tilde, the tick is by itself. If you've never used this key before, congratulations, this is you know, a new day, a new thing to do. So the tick allows you to execute a command um, in a separate process and then return uh, the information. So then it's tick, then date, then there's plus s, uh, right, let's see, plus s, and then, um, and then I execute that. Whoops. And so as I run it, if I was to look at my log file, okay, you can see that the number of seconds since year 1970 is included at the end of the URL, which means that it's going to be a unique error every time. Okay. And so when you add the uh, the loop to it, it's going to have. Uh, um, this property of basically showing you a new URL every two seconds. All right, well, that's very exciting. <laughs> so let's go ahead and do the lab. Uh, when, you, when you are at this point here at the bottom where you have this loop running, then make sure to raise your hand, and I'll come over to take a look at uh, make sure that, that that's running uh, correctly. And, uh, and that's, that's the hands-on hands for tonight.